Should you send your kids to school during COVID? Hi, I'm Dr. Abe, an Associate Professor of Nursing at Western University. And here on What the Health, I want to make your questions clearer. So I'm going to start off the bat right away by saying that this video is going to make you mad. For those of you who don't understand why we never went back to school in the first place, you're going to want me to say that schools are safe and kids should all go back. Uh, for those who think that this is just pouring gasoline on a raging fire, you're going to want me to say this is not safe, it's a terrible idea. And uh, for everyone that's going to make you mad, because I'm not going to say either of those things. I mean, really, the decision about schools overall is not in my hands, it's not in most of our hands, it's being made, kids are going back. And so really, I think what I want to do is prevent you some or provide you some information that's going to help you make your own decisions around what are the risks involved and what are the things that I should be kind of like calculating and in, in making our own choice. Uh, because that's the thing about schools it is it's it's a risk and and schools I would not categorize as safe because I wouldn't categorize any indoor setting that's a congregate environment in the midst of a pandemic as safe not dining not shopping not going to school uh, each are a calculated risk right and so it's just about knowing what are the different factors involved and actually i think it's a bit of a shame that we've been really trying to dichotomize these things because by governments trying to play off schools as like perfectly safe there's been some kind of ludicrous elements in that uh, as well on the flip side of people being like they're not safe at all uh, there's also been uh, some kind of pressure on parents uh, about the decisions they should make. So really what I want to do is I want to just give you some information. And, you know, unlike the, the pediatric society who's like, we need to reassure parents. I, I don't think we need to reassure parents. I think we need to give parents the solid facts so that they can understand what choices they're making and, and that we don't have to skew those choices in one way or another. So. Here are the facts, and I'm going to start with the good stuff, and I'm going to end with some not good stuff. So hopefully you'll bear with me through this, what's going to be a rather long video. Uh, so on the plus side, we do know that two doses of vaccination given relatively recently provides exceptionally high protection related to hospitalization, somewhere in the 80 to 95% range. Uh, so that means if your kids were vaccinated over the holiday, if you accelerated that second dose, uh, then their risk of acquiring a case bad enough to require hospitalization is very low. So there's good protection there. There's also been progress in safety in schools. Now, this is going to vary significantly, of course, by jurisdiction, wherever you happen to be watching from. Uh, but here where I am in Ontario, Canada, at least all classrooms with kids who are too young for vaccination or with kids with special needs have had enhanced air filtration, including HEPA systems. Boards are also distributing three ply masks, so better than um, the cloth, you know, basic cloth mask. Uh, you know, I wish, of course, they were giving out the N95s, KN95s. Um, that would be even better. Uh, but it's it's an improvement, and and that's the thing, right? So while we've been lobbying for safe schools, we've really been pushing for the best, which would be you know HEPA in all classrooms, every kid in a KN95, um, you know, well sized, uh, everyone has rapid tests as much as they need them. Um, that would be the ideal. We're not there, but we are better than you know where we started. So um, again, it's it's decreasing the overall risk. It's not fixing the problem, but it has made things better. Um, and at a large scale population, I do think that this will um, dull to a certain degree the amount of spread we'll see when schools open. I also think that generally kids and teachers have improved significantly around their personal practices related to the pandemic. And so, you know, quality of masking, making sure they keep it on as much as possible, the way they interact, et cetera, et cetera. Again, like these feel like, you know, kind of half measures towards the best. Uh, but each of these factors matters in reducing that degree of virus in the community. 
And so even things like talking to your kid about, hey, you know, when you go for lunch, eat as quickly as possible and get your mask back on because infection is related to the amount of dosage. Uh, and so if you can minimize that time, you decrease the likelihood they acquire the virus. And if they get it, you decrease the likelihood of a severe illness. So again, these don't feel like perfect solutions versus like, you know, something where they wouldn't end up eating unmasked together. But each one is a small improvement that reduces the personal risk. Uh, so if there's parents out there with kids who are double vaccinated, who are sending their school kids to school on Monday, I get that. They're screening them for illness ahead of time. They're reminding them about personal protocols. Um, there's a risk here, but there are several partial measures in place to reduce that risk. And so, so I would understand why a parent would be like, yeah, my, my kid's vaccinated, they're going back to school, you know, we'll screen them, all that kind of stuff. So let's talk about the flip side and look at some of the less encouraging elements of this decision. So the first is vaccination again. Uh, if your child is not vaccinated and hasn't recently had COVID, Given the breadth of community spread right now and what we've seen in terms of other jurisdictions that have gone back to school quicker than where I am, it is highly likely, I would say, that your child will acquire COVID. Um, given the scale of the outbreak, any child five and up, at this point in time, I just can't fathom a decision not to vaccinate it because they're be vaccinated. There's so much COVID out there uh, and we do know kids can get COVID. Uh, so I know there's risks um, that concern people about the vaccine, but again, we're talking about weighing risk factors. And to be perfectly blunt about it, if you've decided that it's riskier to get the vaccine, you're just wrong. The data is really clear. All of the adverse events that can happen with the vaccine, as you see on this graph here, can happen from getting COVID and are much more likely to happen from COVID. So with COVID being everywhere, that is your greater risk for your child. So if they are vaccine eligible, get them vaccinated. That's your best protection. So I wanna talk for a second to those with kids in kindergarten who are not yet vaccine eligible. And honestly, my heart goes out to you of all the scenarios that are being weighed by parents this weekend, I think you're left with the hardest one. Um, this is also the age that if your child does stay home, they're the most time consuming uh, and it, it, it makes working from home very, very difficult. Yes, the good news is the HEPA filters will be in place for this age. Um, but honestly, you've got a tough decision that it, it's where you have less control, right? Uh, compared to parents who've had that opportunity to vaccinate. So there's no wrong decision for you to make. Um, you've got to do what you've got to do. You've got the toughest decision. My heart goes out to you. Sorry that you're in this situation. Now for high school, I wanted to talk for a second too, because the vaccine situation here is, is kind of interesting. So in high school, we have 80% plus vaccinated in, in my region which is amazing. Um, and uh, some of the Canadian data on the vaccines that just came out, which was like scary numbers, has already been withdrawn as being corrected. So you might've heard something about boosters being only 37% effective. That data is wrong. It was obvious the calculations were wrong because there were some negative numbers in there that couldn't be negative. Um, and so if we look at other studies, boosters provide 50 to 80% protection against Omicron. So if you're boosted, you still shouldn't get Omicron. So this idea of like everyone's gonna get it, still totally reject that idea. But back to youth, youth have two doses but the biggest problem here is that many of them are four to five months out of that second dose and so we know two things one is the vaccines are a little bit less protective against omicron they are still protective against hospitalization two doses but the protection against acquiring the infection goes down uh, over time and significantly after month three so I think actually protection for youth from getting the infection is pretty low right now for that population. So it's a real shame that they couldn't get boosted over the holiday. That would have been to me a game changer with an 80% plus uptake for youth. So I think actually there will be quite a bit of COVID that circulates amongst high school ages. 
um, just because of that uh, decline of the protection. Now again, it does protect still against hospitalization, so that's the good news on that side. So why do I think this is going to be generally fairly um, significant, probably moderate spread throughout schools when kids go back? Well, the main factor is that all the elements of risk are there, which is being indoors, being with multiple people, and being there for a long period of time. So it checks all those boxes. And in the elementary school, we're looking at only 50% first doses. Some of those having just gotten the dose this weekend, that won't even be, the immunity won't even be, be there. So, uh, and then for youth, it's that that, that has, protection has declined over time. So in weighing the risk, I would say, yeah, schools are safer, right? Than many of the environments that kids have been in over the past month. So, you know, over the holidays, there was these, you know, in-person, indoors, unmasked, long period of time gatherings that people were having. Way riskier than, you know, a triple layer mask, a happen in the most dangerous classrooms, a couple of rapid tests, you know, these factors uh, will will make the school setting safer, but it's still going to be circulating. Uh, I still predict that cases are going to, to bump back up. So if you've stuck with me all this way, one of the things you're probably wondering is, well, so what about infection, right? So, okay, many unvaccinated kids are going to get COVID. Uh, some of the youth are going to end up getting it. Uh, but, you know, if it's not that serious for most kids, then most of them will be managed at home with their illness. And like, why, why should I even care? Like, maybe we should just kind of like suck it up. So there's a couple other bad news points to respond to that. And the first is the risk of hospitalization. So, yes, you can see from this graph here that kids are the least likely to be hospitalized for COVID. And interestingly, you see the little uptick on the zero to four there because they aren't vaccinated at all. Uh, so you can actually see the, the impact of vaccination uh, by age there. Uh, but yes, the hospitalization is, is lowest for kids and youth. But this doesn't necessarily weigh into how we calculate personal risk because your child's risk of being hospitalized in any year outside of COVID is, is almost zero. Like they probably won't be hospitalized. Now, if you add the risk of hospitalization due to COVID for an unvaccinated child, you have increased their personal risk of being hospitalized by several orders of magnitude, right? So you've gone from like, they won't be hospitalized this year to they may be hospitalized this year. And for me, like, that's not the kind of approach I take with my kids, right? I, I reduce the risk of hospitalization in many aspects of their lives. And so that's why, why my own kids are vaccinated, uh, for example. So the other big factor, of course, is like this huge question mark, which is about the long term effects of COVID. Now, because the science is still evolving in this area, of course, we can't really make policy based on potential. Um, but I do think it weighs into our own personal decision making. Now, the good news about long COVID is that in terms of what we see within a year of infection, I think the reality of the numbers are quite a bit lower than has been shared in several stories about long COVID. And that's because the some of the early data collection on long COVID was self-reported data on headache, on fatigue, on lack of concentration, and wasn't controlled against the general population. More recently, they've controlled against the general population, which is also seeing those rates go way up. And so the effect of long COVID is probably more in the 10% or even under of people uh, within the first six months and then actually uh, going quite a bit down from there. Um, so mostly resolving on its own. Now, on the flip side, so that's good news that it's like probably not the like 50% that some people are quoting. Uh, on the flip side, though, is that it is very real and can be very severe. So we know already about COVID that there is a vascular disease element to it. And, and personally, as an athlete, that's the part that has been most motivating for me personally to make my goal not to get it at all. 
because that can include things like stroke, cardiac um, injury, and uh, pulmonary embolism, all which can be very, you know, athletic career limiting. Um, so those are concerns. And then th most recently, there's been some research showing demyelination, and then there's the potential for uh, it killing off your naive T cells, which is kind of your, your inborn immunity, um, and dispersing itself through your organs and tissues. Uh, again, all of this science is very much in, in its infancy. We don't know how it's going to evolve throughout the course of your life. Uh, but there is a risk there. We know things like Epstein-Barr, for example, which is mono, has been recently linked to uh, MS. Uh, we know that shingles uh, comes from the herpes virus. And so, again, there's, there's some kind of question marks about like, well, are we gambling as well with what this might do? If it is actually killing off our T cells, does that make us at risk for future things like uh, cancer risk going up? So, again, we can't, you know, make hard decisions based on that we don't have percentages we don't know uh, all of this but uh, but it is something that we need to weigh when we think about should we just let everyone get this disease so where does this leave us well i think honestly it leaves us again with making personal choices based on all these factors but also the factors of your own lives and your own kids lives so what do your kids want what do they want to do how's their mental health and does going to school make their mental health better or does going to school make their mental health worse? Are there viable options that your school board is offering for delaying their return, maybe for another week or two until community cases come down? Are they recently two dose vaccinated? Do they follow masking and hygiene directions well? Do they have any other health vulnerabilities? How's their teacher control the classroom? And so I thought I would conclude by sharing our decisions and how we're working through these things with the kids. I know it's kind of personal, but I want to be honest with you to kind of help you see how these decisions play out. So for our oldest, he's 16, he's double vaccinated, and he's going to be going back to school. Um, he's not been learning well online. He has to be hands on. That's how he learns. Uh, and he does follow directions well, so I'm comfortable with that. He's going to be safe. Uh, in terms of his own actions. Um, I really wish he could have been boosted before going back, but I do know at least two doses is protective against hospitalization uh, for teens. So number two son, it's different. Um, he's 14, he's very independent thinker, incredibly intelligent, and so we're leaving the decision primarily in his hands. Uh, and to be honest, he doesn't feel great about the idea. He follows the stats pretty closely. He knows that things are pretty bad right now. And he also knows that things will get better in the relatively near future. Uh, he also knows his marks aren't going to drop if that he doesn't go back to school. So I wouldn't be surprised if he chooses to stay home for a week. Uh, for our daughter, she's in grade seven. She has a chronic lung disease, but it's well managed right now. So there is a concern there. Uh, however, on the plus side, she's able to come home for lunch and our school where she's at is very small and it's exceptionally diligent. Uh, so I actually think that the the classroom exposure for her is, is probably going to be pretty low. Uh, so we got her a really good pediatric KN95 equivalent. Um, so she'll be well masked. She won't have to take that mask off at all during the day uh, in the school. Because uh, she, like I said, can can be home. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so I think she's going back and I think she'll be all right. So what should you do? Uh, well, there's really no right answer here, right? So going to school is a risk. Um, it's a calculated risk, though. And I can definitely see why it'd be reasonable for some parents to take that risk, like we're probably taking with, with two of our kids. Uh, staying home is safer, but it can have other personal and familial consequences uh, as well. So the only decision I really can't fathom out of all of them that's available is not vaccinating eligible kids. Uh, and it's not too late to do so. So yeah, uh, sign them up if, if you haven't already. It just makes sense. Uh, so be safe, and I hope this info is helpful for your own considerations.